All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, those joining us online. Thank you for uh, your patience. Uh, so you should have all gotten a handout by now. Uh, we're starting. We're finally, I know you've been eagerly awaiting the day when we open our small catechisms and start using them. And that day, that day is today. So uh, we're going to start digging into the Ten Commandments. And I did want to start with a word of prayer. And then we're going to make, I'm going to make one point before we get into the Ten Commandments. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you have given us. Help keep us mindful of your blessings during a time of, of trial and adversity so that we don't lose sight of your grace being present here even now. We ask that that grace, that spirit of contentment and peace be among us as we study your word, as we seek to grow in our faith and ask good questions and have good discussion. Bless that discussion that may build us up and edify you. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. So I was having a conversation with somebody this week. And the conversation made me think that I need to make an important distinction. And this I thought would be very important for you to know about me going forward as your pastor. But I think it's an important distinction in general. And that is, in the context of this classroom, and in the context of this study, we're going to be stating doctrinal truths, scriptural truths, as, as pretty much as plainly as we can. What that does not then mean is that if you're involved in something or your family's involved in something of a personal nature that's related to one of the things we're talking about, I'm not going to show up and be like, well, here's how things are, and that's it, okay? So I don't want you to get the impression that the way that we're talking about the scriptural truths that we're discussing or even things that are related to like a personal nature. So let's say, just as an example, we're talking about the first commandment, and we're talking about not worshiping other gods, and maybe you have a family member or a child or somebody close to you who is not a believer. And so there's some sensitive stuff there, okay? In the context of this class, I'm not really going to get into some of the personal things because this is an appropriate place, but I wanted you to know that even if we're going to state something simply, that doesn't mean the issues surrounding it are simple. So I wanted you to know that like in my, my pastoral approach won't be well, there's only one true God. I'm sorry your son doesn't worship Jesus anymore. Anymore, just deal with it. Okay. So that's not going to be the approach that I take in a pastoral sense when I'm in those moments with you. But in the context of the classroom, we're discussing what is true and what's not true. Right? We're discussing what does the Bible tell us about these things in an objective sense, not necessarily in all these other little examples. Okay. Now, I also don't want you to think that the truth is going to change given those personal circumstances. It won't, but the way in which it's applied and walked through with you is, of course, very different. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I just wanted to assure you that I'm not going to show up in a time of crisis and personal need and just blindly assert scriptural truths without any context or sensitivity to the struggles that often surround those things. Okay. Because I think in the context of a classroom experience, you can sometimes get that impression. So I wanted to make sure that we were understanding those things. So that you didn't think that that's, you didn't want to call me because you felt like, well, pastor just so strongly asserts things in Bible study. So I'm, I'm worried about bringing him into this situation because I don't think I need that right now. Okay. That doesn't mean that I won't put my foot in my mouth because I, I you know, I'm a normal person like everybody else. So I do that sometimes, but but I just wanted to make that distinction. Yeah, sure. I actually thought just the opposite last week. Oh. And I'll tell you what. I thought that you were very, um, when you were talking about, you learned something at one point about abortion. And the person said to you, your, your teacher said, um, where are you going? You know, um, how do you meet this person? And, and you were like, no, no, you can't have abortion. He said, no. Because we can get to find out where they are. Mm -hmm. And so I think you already very okay. clearly explained where your heart is. You're going to meet them where they need to be met. Well, thank you for that encouragement. I, I just wanted to make sure that that was clearly communicated. So that's, that's great for me here. Thank you. Okay. So open up your catechisms um, to page 58 if you have this version. Um, but you're going to basically try to find the place where it talks about the first commandment in the explanation section of the small category, so the back part. Because <clears throat> we're going to be tying it to scripture, 
and we're going to be talking about it in a little more depth than I would if I was teaching you as seventh graders. Because you guys aren't in seventh grade anymore. <laughs> Okay. Is everybody hearing me well over here? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, good. Okay. Does somebody want to read the first commandment for us? You shall have no other gods. You shall have no other gods. Very good. Somebody online read it. You shall have no other gods. And in case, and when you when you read these and we look at Luther's meanings, the purpose of those meanings are just to further clarify what the commandment is saying. So he's not adding or subtracting anything from the commandment. He's saying, here's what this entails, okay? So, so what does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things, okay? Fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And I have that there for you on your handout, okay? So this question I think came up, I think Jim brought it up uh, maybe two weeks ago. What does it mean to have a God? So let's think about that for a second before I share the Luther quote. So don't read the Luther quote yet. Don't spoil the answer. What does it mean to have a God? What do you think? Put it in your own words. What does it mean to have a God? Everybody has a God. What's most important to you? Okay, so everybody has a God. It's what's it most important to you. Anything else? Any other ideas? Maybe unpack what does it mean it's most important to you? Yeah, Karen. I was just going to say, gives me peace. Okay, God, your God is somebody who gives you peace, right? What brings you peace? Protection. Protection. What else? Safety. What do you have to have in order to provide protection and safety? All the power. All the power, right? You have to be strong. I never heard up in the last class about the uh, exchange between the beavers and the Chronicles of Narnia and the, the, uh, the children. And they are asking about Aslan, who's the Christ figure in the story. And they say, is he safe? And their answer was, he's not safe, but he's good. Right? You don't want a weak person who's leading you, but you want a good person. Right? And so a good and strong person, which, right, which related to the sermon today. That's why it's a relief for him to have joy and authority. Yeah. Well, I think Rob's definition really hits the mark because when people can misunderstand what a God is in the context of their real lives, yes, we can talk about God, right? The first, the our God, mm -hmm. right? Or mm -hmm. you know, the Hindu gods, the Roman gods, whatever right. it is, right? But I think a God is really what. What you value as most important that that drives you, motivates you, you know, that's what you that's what you find is most important in your life. I think that makes it easier for us to relate to people on this topic. I yes. think Rob's way of saying that everybody has a God. That is one hundred percent true. Correct. Everybody has a God. Maybe your God is money. Maybe your God is status or career. Right. That's what you chase after all the time. That's what that's how you make your decisions in life. Very good. So the point that's being made is that the first definition was really good because it points out that what we typically think of as God or a false God is something with a face, right? Uh, a being, but it doesn't have to be, right? And so there's tons of people right now in our world who would say that they don't believe in a God because they're thinking of a God with a face, right? They, they're saying, I don't believe in Zeus. I don't believe in Jesus, I don't believe in Allah, etc. Right, but the point is that they do actually have gods, because everyone has a god. Their god is whatever they're placing their ultimate security in, their sense of worth, and their sense of identity. Okay, so the the question before you guys uh, dropped out was, can this rule be applied in a in too broad a sense? So the example was, if I'm talking to my kids about your phone is too important to you, am I necessarily saying to them that it's become their God, right? So um, I would say that Luther's definition, as well as the one from the commandment, isn't that things that are important to you become your gods. It's the thing that is the most important to you. So if 
if God is still more important to your children than their phones, even though they may be using them more than you like, when you when you, you're you're free not by the first commandment to say that you should be on your phones less, maybe by the fourth, right, or or other other ones, um, that you can you can criticize that behavior without saying that they're thinking it's their God. Um, but it could become their God. So there is a place where if your ultimate security is placed in the things that you use your phone for, your online presence, and without that, you're nothing, right? That's where you get into idolatry, okay? So I think it's worth asking the question, especially in our context, because we're living in a, a lot of times people like to say post-Christian culture, but I, I think it's more broad and you could say it's a post-faith culture. So people think that they no longer believe in stuff. They just go with the science or go with the facts. But a lot of times the way that they've organized their worldview of science or facts, like we talked about at the very beginning are based on beliefs that are very religiously oriented, right? So like I like to make the distinctions between a scientist and someone who's a practitioner of scientism. Because the difference is that someone who's a practitioner of scientism has turned that into their God to answer questions that science does not answer, right? Um, and things like that. So, so the point is well taken that, and, and Luther would echo this. So if you look at the definition I have from Luther here, Luther defines a God as that to which we look for all good and in which we find refuge in every time of need. To have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe him with our whole heart as I have often said, the trust and faith of the heart alone make God, both God and an idol. If your faith and trust are right, then your God is the true God. For those two belong together, faith and God. That to which your heart clings and entrusts itself is, I say, really your God. Okay? And that's from Martin Luther's explanation of this commandment in the large catechism. So he's making that point, right? The point that the God that you're talking about doesn't have to have a face. Doesn't have to be a Baal from the Old Testament or a Zeus character or Vishnu or Allah or Christ. Right? It can be money, it can be reputation, it can be yourself. And often that is what it is for people. Okay? Because like think how easy it is for the devil to usurp the like Western ideals of interdependence, self-reliance. I don't need anybody, I'm gonna pull myself up by my own bootstraps. Well, in that world, who's God? Me, right? Because I'm placing my ultimate security in, in my ability to do stuff, and to take care of myself, and to make the world my own oyster, whatever the phrase is, right? Um, and it can be very tempting. It always makes you think of, if you've heard the poem Invictus, right? I am the, the captain of my, my ship, the master of my soul. Eh, it's all false, right? Um, that's only true if you're God. But it's very tempting to think that, right? I mean, that's the very first thing we got napped with by the devil all the way back to the end. If you do this, you can, you can be like God, knowing good and evil. And we're like, oh, that would be great, right? Because then I can be on my own and be my own God. Except the problem is we're not equipped to do that. So great. So we do it like Luther's big on. The image I try to keep in mind for stuff like this is, and ends up being the same for most of Christian life is that we're driving a car on a mountain road. So if you stray too far this direction, you're going to fall off the cliff. If you stray too far this direction, you're going to grind your car into the mountain. Right? The Christian teachings are usually right in that tension. They don't fit nicely into either category. All right. Uh, somebody want to open their Bibles up? To Isaiah 45 verse 20. Bob's got that. And then who's got Matthew 10 37? Cheryl's got that. All right, Bob, go ahead. Assemble yourselves and come draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge and care about the wooden idols. You keep on praying to a God who cannot save. Okay, so Isaiah's making the point there, prophet of God, that the idols they worship, that they made out of their own materials and by their own hands. There is no God there. It does not exist. It's a man-created idea. Okay, and, and Cheryl has the Matthew 10, 37. We're trying some new stuff, so that's why there might be some weird things happening. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. Um, 
And then um, I would encourage you also, if you have a copy of the Augsburg Confession, you can also find it online. The first article is written concerning God. Okay? Um, and it talks about the characteristics of God. But one of the things that's helpful about the Augsburg Confession is at the end of each one of those sections, it also points out the things that if this is true, then these are not true. So if we believe this, it also means that we reject these things. Okay. Um, and I can bring that to class next time if you're curious. Okay, so we already kind of talked about question number two, but I'm going to ask it anyways. What are some examples of false gods? So we already talked about the Zeus's and Vishnu's and Allah's of the world. But for most people who are struggling with religious belief, they're not struggling with different kinds. Typically, they're struggling with religious belief, period. So what might they have as gods that they may not even realize are gods? Money. Money. Right, money. What? Profession. Profession, right? Politics. Politics, yeah. Science. Science, yeah. Their own family. Their own family, yeah. Right? Yeah, so you're seeing how the implications of the first commandment are actually probably a little bit more far-reaching than you would first guess just by reading the words, right? And this kind of goes to the point I made in my sermon about language. That's why it's so important for us to be in the scriptures, because the scriptures use a lot of language that is also used in the culture, but they use the same words in a completely different way. Right? So, for example, like the best example, I sort of think back on this memory of mine. I preached on, I think it was, it wasn't on Valentine's Day, but like around it. And this has to be like the classic example of first year pastor, like hubris. I preached about how love is the most useless word in the English language, which sounds horrible. Um, but what I meant was that it's used for so many things that the word in and of itself no longer carries very specific meaning. So if you say you love something, people don't really know what you're talking about. They basically hear what they would use it for. And then that's the way they interpret it, right? So that's how, like, I just use that as an example because that's a fairly common word that you see used societally in so many different ways, right? Uh, and so the it's important for us to develop a biblical vocabulary, not that our words are going to be super different, but the particular meanings of those words are defined by God and not by us. Okay. Um, so I, I was attempting to do that with authority in the sermon today, um, but you can also do that with other things like... What is a God? Right? We're, we're finding out that that's a little bit more of a broad category than a lot of people think. All right, everybody turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and we're going to look at verses 4 through 6. And as we read that, ask yourself this question. Can anyone really be a true atheist? Now, what is an atheist? No God. No God, right? So, and, and when we say no God, now think of the definition that we've just sort of thrown out as God. So an atheist at its core claims that there's no such thing like that. Okay? All right. Somebody got 1 Corinthians 8? Look. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, whom from all things and for all, whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom we are all things and through whom we exist. Thank you. All right. So what is he saying is actually, is there an existence of a being within an idol? Yes or no? Paul says there, there isn't, right? There's nothing actually there. And so this gets a little confusing, so I want to make sure we're, I, I, I say it clearly. So we're asking this question, are, can anyone really be a true atheist? We're thinking from our own perspective here. So let's say you have a friend who's an atheist, and maybe they're, they're a very antagonistic atheist. Um, your first thought may be, methinks they doth protest too much, <laughs> 
right? Because if they don't think that God really exists, then why do they seem to care about him so much? They just care about him in a negative sense, right? But what's really from our perspective going on is we have this picture and definition of what we just talked about as God, which means that even though they're claiming to be an atheist, they're claiming to be atheists just based on the idea that they don't believe in a Zeus or a Jesus or in a law. But we know better. Because they're worshiping something, whether or not it's what they actually think it is, or even they themselves might not even be aware of it. But um, so there's a, a really good book series, which we might do, a, a, you know, some study on later on, which is a, a the book series called Desiring the Kingdom. It's by a reformed theologian, uh, James K.A. Smith. And in that book, he posits two like key claims about humans. One is that we're primarily desiring beings and not thinking beings. In other words, like just giving a rational argument about what something is true does not actually convince people to live that way. So the example I usually give, because everybody can relate, is how many of you know that if you ate food that was healthy for you, went to the gym on a daily basis, that you'd be healthy? Everybody knows that, right? Nobody really doubts that. How many of you do that on a daily basis? Like just knowing it is not very motivating, right? So he's, he's making the argument that what, motiv what motivates humans is primarily their desires. Which is why people, when they do advertising, they don't give you the rational, well, this tire is better than the other tire because it has this thing in it and it does this thing scientifically. They don't do that. What's in their commercial? Like a really cool looking car driving in the middle of the desert somewhere, zipping around, giving you a picture of the good life, right? If you get this car and these tires, your life will be like this, okay? Um, the second uh, point that he makes, which is related to this, is that... Um, human beings, and Rob sort of alluded to this earlier, are worshiping creatures, period, full stop. We have to worship something. It comes with the territory of being a creature. So if we remove God, our definition of God is what we're worshiping. We inevitably find something else to worship, whether or not we recognize it as God. It's just part of our nature. We can't not do that. It's like breathing. Yeah. So when Allie made us do that apologetic study, <laughs> uh, <laughs> one of the things that came through to me um, in the whole first section of that study where, you know, is there a God? That's really what it was about, is all of those philosophers, you know, maybe the closest who came to it was Nietzsche, right? All of them had a bunch of rationalizations, right? Mm -hmm. they, they had so many workarounds because they came, they always came to the same place and they wanted to get to some other, so they found some rationalizations to get around that there in fact is a God. That's what came out to me. Yeah. Maybe the author intended that, but, right. but Nietzsche was, a, was a, at least in my view, the closest one to pure, there is no God. Yeah. You know, he didn't right. like it either. <laughs> no, yeah, right. That's, that's a great point. So uh, the point was made that during the apologetic study, one of the things that came out of that was that all these different uh, uh, people who rejected Christianity had all these rationalizations for doing so, but they usually ended up in a similar place uh, in their attempts to get around the reality of God, right? And that's probably related to both those things that God, God's existence is just sort of an immutable fact of creation that on some level we know, and two, that it is within our nature to worship something as God. Okay. So if both those are true, then you can really never get away from it. Right, so you always find a substitute, even when you're trying to pretend like you don't have one. Right, because think about that if you really had no belief in an ultimate thing, whether you think that ultimate thing is you or money or reputation or whatever, I mean, what is your motivation for doing anything? Right, there's no reason to get out of bed. If somebody you know has these weird expectations of me and you could make the arguments as they do that there's some societal implications and like self-preservation things but those don't really ultimately provide continued motivation to the creature yeah Alan. the next study that we did that i chose <laughs> which ultimately and unfortunately ended up being too intellectually challenging for my yeah, um, <laughs> I totally agree, 100%. Also, that was Ali's big mistake. <laughs> um, 
we can't, you know, the idea is, is present that because um, humans need something to worship, they will create a god. Yes. Yep. And so, you know, that's used against Christianity in that sure. um, we need to have something to worship and to feel like something is in control. Sure. And so we created the idea of God. Yeah. So what, um, that's a more that like, with? that's a more, a nicer academic argument that is based on the idea that religion is the opiate of the masses. Right. right. Um, mm -hmm. So those are typically difficult conversations because, so sorry, the, the point that was made was that because of this worshiping impulse that everybody has, that's an argument that sometimes is made against the, the existence of a Christian God because we just made up this God so we had something to worship and feel good about ourselves. Um, those are typically difficult conversations because it's a faith versus faith thing, right? It's not, it's not a, it's not really in that sense an apologetics discussion anymore at that point because someone is making a statement of faith, which is that I believe you made up your God, and your response is a statement of faith that I believe He's real, right? And that's as far as that discussion can go, frankly, to be totally honest. I mean, you can. You can give some reasoned explanations as to why you think he's real, but they're not really defenses of the existence of God because they all exist within faith. And if somebody doesn't have that faith, they're not probably going to be very convinced by it. Right? Because you could interpret like any sort of proclamation of the gospel that I give that's a joyous thing to hear could be interpreted as, see, that's why you wanted to make up that God so you feel good about your life and yourself and all the screw-ups that you make. Right? Because to a cynical person, the gospel is like, the definition of too good to be true. So, so it's so convenient for you that you have this God who, even though there's no reason to love you, loved you anyways and came down and did all the work of saving you because you couldn't. I mean, that's super convenient. If somebody has a lens of interpretation about all life that way, it's very difficult to have a conversation of really any purpose in that discussion. So typically what I do is I maintain the relationship with the person um, and not just for the sake of having the, hopefully having the eventual conversation, but because that's what you ought to do. Um, and they have to come to you in a place where they're willing to hear those things. So I can't start, at that point, once you've reached that point with somebody, you can no longer start that conversation zero. What you can do is lift them up before the throne of grace and trust the Holy Spirit will bring them to the place they need to be brought. And maybe he's not even going to use you for that particular person. Who knows? Uh, and that's where that's where faith really comes in, right? You're you're trusting in, despite the fact that it's frustrating, and I don't really know why this is happening and what's going to happen and what the timeline is. I know that you're in control and you have a plan, and your plan is automatically because it's yours way better than mine. So I know that's not a super satisfying answer, but I, that's I think that's the way to. Um, okay, so the answer to question number three: There, can anyone really be a true atheist? Is no. Because a true atheist would literally have belief in nothing. And we believe from our perspective that a human has to worship something. So if they, if they toss out the true God, they're going to create one or just inevitably fall into that same sort of belief in something else. It's inevitable. Right? It can be their country. It can be their government. It can be them. It can be their money. It can be their reputation, etc. Right? Um, if you want to see an example of what happens when... God or sin blows those idols apart. The probably the most poignant, for whatever reason, for me, example of that was in the movie Friday Night Lights. So, if you've seen the movie Friday Night Lights, you will remember the scene where the running back that starts the season's name is Booby Miles, and he's a he's a very very good football player. He's not particularly smart. He doesn't do that well in school. He comes from a poor, broken family. And the first game of their, his senior season, and he's going to get all of these looks from colleges. He tears up his knee really badly. And there's a scene where he goes into the locker room to get his stuff because he's done for the season. And he doesn't even know if he's going to play football ever again in his entire life. And he puts on a brave face for his buddies and all of that. And he gets in the car. I think it's with his uncle or his uh, grandpa. And just, you just visibly see his whole person is destroyed. Because that was his life. 
That's what it means to hold something to the level of Godhood. Because that was his whole life was wrapped up in that. Now that doesn't mean that when something precious to you is taken from you that you can't mourn it. Okay. But it shouldn't destroy you to your core because your core is that you're a child of God redeemed by the blood of Jesus. So while it may stink right now that you can't play football anymore, in an ultimate sense, you're fine. And that's what you run to in, in moments like that. Maybe you've been in a moment like that, right? Um, and that's that's why we always point to Jesus, right? So I would recommend that. I can't. I wanted to show it as a clip in a sermon one time, and I can't do that because it has some swear words in it. But like, so it, you know, don't watch it with your five-year-old kids, but watch it, watch it yourself. Um, okay, uh, turn to page sixty-one in your catechism and we're looking at what does it mean to fear love and trust in god above all things so i'm just going to brush over this really quick because with the definition that some of the people gave it sort of brought this up ahead of time uh, what does it mean to fear and trust love and trust in god above all things and this point uh question <clears throat> this question in the catechism on page 61 is basically pointing out that it's not just a God if it has a face, right? So it talks about human achievements, such as intellect, technology, or medical advances, human goodness or religious devotion, money and possessions, pleasures such as food, drink, sex, sports, or entertainment. And then the bottom one, even family and friends, right? And there's all scripture references there for you to look at for specific examples of scripture for those things. Probably the one that sticks out the most is family, right? Uh, and then, of course, the scripture reference there is when um, Jesus is teaching and somebody comes in and says, hey, Jesus, your family, they're outside, they're waiting on you. And he says, oh, my family are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Right. In other words, if the decision is family allegiance or allegiance to me, the answer is allegiance to me. Right? Which is not, which which is a perfect example of what I said at the beginning, right? That's easy to say in the context of a classroom. That doesn't mean that it's not a brutal reality that carries a lot of suffering, that, that needs a lot of compassion, a lot of grace, okay? Because um, that's difficult, that's difficult. And the people who do experience that don't need me to tell them that. Okay, <clears throat> any questions about that before we move on, since we really sort of talked about that already? Uh, and I don't think I can see everyone online with the way the camera's set up. So if you do have something, just go ahead and say it. I will, if you raise your hand, I won't still be able to see it. Uh, number five, what are some examples of the first commandment being used as a curb, mirror, or guide? So you remember our three uses of the law from last week, the curb, mirror, guide. So give me some examples of ways that the first commandment can be used in one of those three ways. Or all three. I think it's a mirror because it, it does point out to us that we have we do have worshipful tendencies and we have to, to look at ourselves kind of on a on a routine basis and think about what it is that we put our trust in. Yeah, very good. So uh, the point was made that it's it's it functions as a mirror because we do have those tendencies to worship something even if it's not God. And so we have to look at ourselves periodically and, and assess, you know, has this become more important than it should be? So a great example might be a, a sporting events. Maybe you said the sign on for a travel baseball team. And it started out just like, you know, one weekend here, one weekend there, where we're saying, you know what, we go to church every week. We can watch it online while we're there. And it's not a big deal. But maybe it gets to the point, and this is I've done it, gets to the point where it's like, F, like three out of the four Sundays of the month. So like baseball is Sunday morning and church is online in the car or something like that. Then you might want to start asking yourself, is what is the place of this in my life? When am I communicating to my kids by behaving this way? And myself by behaving this way. So, so, great. What about a curb or a guide? Yeah, Maggie. A curb, I think, with Allie's example about the tongue, that she was curbing it before, before this actually became a broad oh, very good. Yeah, very good. Right? So, so it wouldn't really be the tongue, it would be their social network. That would sure. Be broad. Yeah, so somebody who has godly authority over someone else by 
like a parent with a child, come in and say, I'm going to curb this behavior either because it has become a violation of the First Amendment or it's well on its way and I'm concerned. Right? Um, and those are usually enforced through natural consequences, right? So, um, and that's that's the way the curb functions, right? You, you ram your car under the curb, not usually a pleasant experience for you or your tire, uh, and it brings you back. All right, what about guide? You start to catch it, right? You see it in your life. Yeah. You catch it before it turns into something that has the other consequences. Yeah, right? You start you, you start to catch it before it becomes a problem. So like what we just did today, you came into church and you confessed your sins. All right, right? Not, not because you were necessary, your motivation was not necessarily because you're afraid of the consequences, because you're attempting to turn away by the grace of the Holy Spirit from what you've now been convinced is the improper way to do things. Right? So that's how the guide works. Yeah. Yeah, I was just to say, I think it's a guide too. If we look at it in terms of a positive thing, we look at it as a negative commandment. Yeah. The positive is, the truth is that the happiest human life is the life that knows that, that you know, God is the most important thing. So, right. you know, good. if you want to be happy, if you want to find that ultimate happiness in something that can actually sustain your devotion, love God above all things. Right. Very good. Yes. Hold on. I thought it was never make a pretty woman your wife. Are we changing the rules? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm just going to move right beyond yeah, that. Yeah, so the point was made that uh, it isn't just, we don't just understand the first commandment in a negative sense, but also in a positive sense, that it is, it becomes a joy for the one who is granted faith that, that God is above all things, right? Because now that God is guiding my behavior in a way that is different than before, where I was afraid of being smited, and now I know I'm not going to be smited because of Jesus, and so my goal is to live in accordance with that, because it is now, I know, the best way to do things. Um, like, if you think back to my sermon about when are you the freest, we are freest when you're under the authority of God, um, because that is the best. That's the way you were, in the, you were designed and intended for. Okay, any other questions about first commandment stuff? Pastor. Yeah. I do have, I have a question. I've heard a couple of different thoughts on this before, and I don't know how much it really matters because it's not numbered in the Bible, but I know that some versions of the commandments combine like verses three and four, like Luther does and some separate them. Yeah. So, I was there's also some different numberings for um, like, they'll say the first commandment is you shall have no other gods and the second commandment is you shall not raise up or make a graven image right so we understand those as being part of the same command so what what exactly is your question about three and four i was just i was just wondering why you thought luther combined them versus separated them and then verse 17 i guess he separates into two commandments right which which verse you, oh you're talking about exodus 20 yeah um i'd have to go back and look i don't know that off the top of my head I was just curious. Um, my guess, if I were to guess, it would be related to, like, um, you're talking about the, the combining of Sabbath with honor your father and mother. The coveting one, I think, is two separate ones in the catechism, right? Oh, oh, oh you're talking about, okay, you're talking about commandments 9 and 10. Covenants yeah. Okay. Um, I think... Those were separated probably because the nature of the coveting is less materialistic in one and more for a broader category. Um, but the, the spirit of those are the same. So I don't know exactly why those were made into two. I can look that up, but I don't know. If I'm... I was just curious why there were different versions of the Ten Commandments. So Yeah. So uh, the only one I do know for sure is the reason that the numbers end up different from time to time is because of the separation of having one God and then the making of a graven image. Some, like we have that just all in, under one and then some have one and two there. But I can look at the other ones. I've never looked at the other ones. Good question. Do you have a belief system yep. on the three denominations that have it split that way? It may be. I haven't looked at the ones that split nine and 10 or not. Um, or if I did, it's been a long time. Um, so I can look that up though. Okay, any other questions about First Commandment? Okay. 
Uh, second commandment, so page 67 in your uh, catechism, so the explanation portion, we're going to skip ahead. There's, so I would encourage you, if there's a particular commandment that you have, that you want to learn more about, we're not going to have time to go through all the questions that are in here in the explanation, but there are some very good ones. I'm trying to highlight the ones that I think most people naturally have questions about when they, when they read the commandments, but there's a lot of good stuff in here, and they give you the scripture references for everything, so... Um, I would encourage you to take some time if you're, if the first commandment's a sticking point for you, or the fourth, or the sixth, or the ninth, or whatever, uh, really kind of dig into some of those. We're not going to have time to look at all of it. Okay. Someone want to read the second commandment for us? Yeah, Jen. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. All right. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. So, um, to the point that Russ made about uh, the first commandment, Luther tries to highlight in each one of his explanations that we're not meant to just understand these commandments as, here's what you're doing if you're breaking them. You're also um, encouraged in the positive sense, right? So see how he says, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, pray, and give thanks. Okay. So you're not keeping this law merely by not breaking it. You're also in the spirit of keeping the law by using it for its positive purpose. Right? So using the Lord's name in a positive way. Okay. Uh, number one, what is the relationship between the blank and the tongue? So look at uh, Luke chapter 6. Somebody got Luke 6, 43 through 45. Maggie's got that. And then somebody else, James 3. Oh, I've got James 3. All right. Uh, Maggie, whenever you're ready. <coughs> All right, so for out of the abundance of his heart, the mouth speaks. That summarizes that quite well. All right, and then James 3. How many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers? Did you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly? We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never fallen in what they say is perfect. Also, your whole body be checked. When we put bits in the mouth of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take chips and bits in it. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes a great boast. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole force of one's life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. All right, that's good. That's good. I had one through ten there, but that's all. That's pretty heavy, right? So, um, what's our blank here? What's the relationship between the blank and the tongue? What do you think it is? The heart. The heart. Very good. The heart. Okay. Uh, the imagery that's used there. So, in the first reading, it's out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then the second reading from James talks about images like. Uh, the bridle that's put in a horse's mouth that can move the body, the entire horse, or the, the small rudder that moves a giant ship, right? In other words, what is what you speak matters because it comes from your heart, right? Um, now, that doesn't mean your heart is full of what you're speaking, but it has a part of whatever you're saying has a home in your heart. 
And that's mainly used in scripture as a caution. Because it's easy. And I, I myself have made this rationalization like, well, you know, I'm just saying that. It's not, it's not really how I feel. But if we're being honest, there's always a little bit of real feeling in the heart based on what you're saying. Um, so we're talking about that because the second commandment is about misusing the name of God. Um, so how is God's name misused? So if you turn to page 69 in your catechism. Question 44 there on page 69. How do we fear and love God in keeping the second commandment? First, we fear and love God by not using his name in A, to swear thoughtlessly or meaninglessly or as a curse word, right? So, of course, the example of that that we all usually think of is OMG, right? OMG would be a violation of this. Um, you're using God's name in a thoughtless or meaningless manner. So you're not, you know, which... It's important to, to make the distinction that you're not, you know, actively and intentionally like shaking your fist at God when you say that. But like, this is why the heart and the tongue connection is important. Right? That you're speaking something thoughtlessly doesn't mean that it's not spiritually dangerous to you because you're not aware of the spiritual um, All right, the second one, letter B, to try to manipulate God for our purposes in sorcery or as a magic charm, or to curse others. Uh, so that one you can put like in the blank there. Um, well, somebody want to look up Leviticus 24, verse 16 for us? Leviticus 24, verse 16. Maggie's got it. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him. Okay, so what a great example of our law distinctions, right? Uh, Leviticus 24, 16. All those who blaspheme, so you can put that in the blank there, blaspheming God's name uh, or blasphemy. Um, and then the, the if we're going back to our, our designations before, the political law application of that given to Israel was that the congregation stones the person who speaks God's name in that way, right? Obviously, we don't do that, but we still believe that blasphemy is a sin, right? And you shouldn't do it. And if you hear someone doing it, you should encourage them not to do that. Uh, all right, false swearing. Um, so uh, what does it mean to swear? Yeah, yep, or, an oath or swearing, swearing in, they sometimes call it, right? So uh, swearing isn't just saying a bad word. That's what we typically think of. Swearing is synonymous with cussing. Swearing covers more than just curse words. Um, but it's a, like, it's complicated because curse words have, have developed into something other than what they originally were. Uh, just if you look at the title of curse words, they're originally words used to what? Curse someone, right? So if you, if you said, uh, um, it's hard to say this without actually saying that. Um, so uh, if you use D-A-M-N and then say you, what you're actually doing originally that started with, you're actually saying like, I damn you to hell. And so it, it's a curse word to say that to somebody, right? From a Christian perspective, that and then if you add God to the front of it are, are the worst things you can tell someone. Um, and if you add God in front of it, it's also blasphemous in, in addition to being a curse. Yeah. We're saying in both, whether it be positive or negative. Correct. Correct. Yes. And Jesus speaks to this when he says that let your yes simply be yes and your no simply be no. There's no need to say like, I swear on my mother's grave or I swear on the truth of Jesus or I swear that the cross, I swear on the fact that the cross, the event of the cross happened. He said, don't do any of that. You don't need to do that. Let your yes simply be yes and your no simply be no. Okay. Uh, satanic arts. So this would be um, like seances and Ouija boards and stuff like that where you're, whether you're doing it as a joke or not, 
So if, if you get a whiff that your kids are being tempted to do something like that with their friends, or if you even are, like, you put a kibosh on that immediately. Because even though we're the enlightened Western society and we want to be able to explain everything by mental illness and science, the scriptures clearly talk about unclean spirits. I mean, it was in our gospel reading today. So don't mess with that stuff. Don't mess with that stuff. Um, so uh, speaking the Lord's name in, in the context of those things is violation of the second commandment. All right, somebody got Jeremiah 23, 12. Uh, Cheryl, you want to read that one for us? Jeremiah 23, 12. I will get it for you. And then um, let's see. Russ, can you read the Matthew 7, verse 21? No. Okay. All right, go ahead, Cheryl. Okay, 12. Therefore, their path will become slippery. They will be banished to darkness, and there, and there they will fall. I will bring disaster on them in the year they will be punished, declares the Lord. Is that chapter 23, verse 12? Jeremiah? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I put the wrong verse. Read the, go ahead and read the Matthew one. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. I'm not sure why I have the Jeremiah one. Sorry about that. It has been 23 6. Uh, this is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Maybe. I think I may have accidentally, in. I'll have to go back and look at my notes. Sorry. Right. So for five and six there, under how God's name is used, I'm not sure why I wrote the things I wrote there. <laughs> so I'll get back to you on that. Because um, my next stuff is. Uh, how God's name is honored. Hmm. So I think the Jeremiah one. Oh, okay. So the Jeremiah one is. Um, it should have been thirty-one and thirty-two, um, and that is to use God's name to teach falsely. So false teaching is that blank. Um, so saying that God is saying something He's not. Uh, and then can you read the Matthew seven again? Sure. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So the idea, I think, being like, that people would maybe call out, call out his name without yeah. having known him or done his will. Right. Which would fall under the thoughtless rules, I think. Yeah. Don't worry about the blank on six. Yeah, Alan. I don't know if we have time, but... Or if another time you can talk more about that one because they're yeah. saying to they're calling God they're calling Jesus Lord so why aren't they entering the kingdom of heaven? Well, so I should read the other two verses that follow that. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So I think what that's referring to is if Paul runs into uh, people that did this or he references it too, um, where there are people who do those things either for personal gain without genuine faith or they are um, saying it out of spite. So in general, he actually is thankful that even though they're saying it out of spite, it's being said, but not really for the person saying it, but those who hear. Right. So. Um, so what, what's being pointed out here is that you're in, you're, you're, you yourself are in danger when you speak to God in this manner, when you're sort of using his name for your own purposes. So they're calling on him as Lord, but then they don't do anything that he says. So they don't like, so they're vocally saying he's Lord, but in their heart, he's not, is the distinction that's been made. Like they're exaggerating. Yeah. Right. So, or they, they might find, like in our culture, they might find a, a position in where they're like, it's convenient for me to, for everyone to think that that I believe in God, even though I may really not. So, these are people, it just seems to me, though, that by the act of calling him Lord, that's an admission that he's their Savior, because that's what Jesus means when he says Lord. 
So, but I think the, the distinction that's being made here is not, is between what's said and what is in the heart, right? So this so, verse is used to make, to scare Christians, like by the types of preachers that do that, by saying, you may think that you are saved, but really you're not doing the right stuff. Like you may call him your It Lord. can be used in that manner. It it's is. It's more of it's a, like that. it's more of a, yeah. uh, well, I mean, you can use anything for nefarious purposes. I could beat somebody to death with my shoe. So the correct yeah. way to, to answer that to people like that, who would use, to make, use this to make people question their faith. Well, that would be an incorrect usage of it. The yeah. correct usage of it is helping them understand that don't think that just because you say this that you're that you're doing what you need to do as a as a Christian or reflecting Christian that, that is real, you know. Um, so I think it's again drawing like a caution to the connection between the heart and the tongue. Um, so don't I mean the whole general purpose of the second commandment is don't thoughtlessly use God's name for whatever other purpose other than glorifying him or bringing him glory you know, in their lives. So in this instance, if you're using the name of like essentially what it's saying is if this is you, beware. So, you know, there are really harsh things about the law of God. This would be one of them. You know, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that you're... The law is scary. You know, it, it, it should be scary to you. Like, not because the law is bad, but because of what it shows you about yourself. Perhaps, so this is in that same vein. Perhaps hearkening back to what we were talking about at the beginning, right? Maybe what this sort of vignette in... Jeremiah, no, we're at, we're Matthew. Matthew, Matthew is saying is if you wait until the very end to make God your God, right, it's too late. Maybe yeah. you, you don't want to, you do that at your own peril, right? If, 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 if you're seeking your refuge and your solace, I mean, this also, this late day, there, there is that element to it, but it's yeah. also referencing that they're the person in question is actually referencing to past events where they say that i was calling oh. on you right um so i think it may be a more uh like this could be the natural end for someone who's like a false teacher right so somebody who said the name of god and they talked about god a lot but they didn't really actually listen to what god said they just used his name for their own purposes mm -hmm. right Jim, Jim so, well, right and so we're also, I mean, this is this comes right at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And so it comes after, like he's talked about, you know, various subjects, but right before that, he's talked about the wearing of false prophets, you know, wolves in sheep's clothing, um, the good tree bearing good fruit, etc. So it's it's like along those same themes that right after that. So it, so he's continuing a, a theme of talking about people. And, and bringing to mind the fact that there are people out there that will use, that will yeah. basically use God's authority or use the name without really having anything other than their own power or their own advancement. Part. Right. And I guess to answer the concern that you're voicing, Allie, the mere fact that you're worried about the connection would mean that that is not talking to you. Right. So it can't be used to like scare a Christian who's going to your church and listening to God's word into thinking that their faith isn't real just because they're speaking the words. I mean, the fact that they're concerned about that means that it is. It kind of hinges though on like all that stuff using God's name to preach um, incorrect things or say incorrect prophecies. But this verse says, "Everyone who says to me." Lord, Lord. So that's someone calling Jesus Lord. Yeah, but you can do that disingenuously. That's what he's referring to. That's why Jesus is here so, in the flesh and people were physically talking to him. Yeah. That doesn't apply to today's time. Well, I, I think it does because you can still do what people did then, right? They heard the very Son of God preaching the truth to them, and still many rejected him. Right? So, you know, if somebody comes up to him and, and, and addresses him in that manner, but in their heart, they clearly don't hold him as that. That's what he's referring to. He's saying, well, outwardly you did, but, but you didn't really believe it. Right? So it's not really referencing somebody who has genuine faith. 
Um, so, like, should it should there be aspects of what that's saying that are frightening to you? Yeah. I mean, the purpose of the law is not to make us feel comfortable. In some cases, it's to make us feel uncomfortable. So we go to Christ. Um, so that this, you know, can't, it, all aspects of the law could be used in that way, right? The curve near the guide could be the curve could be the mirror. Um, and this is one of those. Yeah, Karen. And this is the last thing we got to yeah. wrap up. Doesn't it also just, it's a hard issue. Like, it's yeah, so I mean, the context that Russ pointed out, so the, the question was, it's a hard issue, isn't it? Which is true. I mean, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, that's the big point of the Sermon on the Mount. The big point of the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus is addressing the, the, his, the God's chosen people who have now convinced themselves that they're keeping the law. And he's emphasizing that the only thing that you're focusing on is the exterior. And so that's why he goes through all these major things and says, if you think you're not breaking the fifth commandment, just because you haven't killed someone, truly, truly, I say to you that you have anger in your in your heart for your brother and call him fool, you are guilty of violating this commandment. Right? So, like, the Sermon on the Mount is actually really a harsh, law-oriented approach that Jesus takes at the beginning of his ministry because he's trying to draw people to repentance and ultimately to him. Because at the point that he, he comes into their life, what they're trusting in is their ability to keep the law in an external sense. So the first thing that he breaks down for them is like, actually, you're not keeping the law. Let me teach you what God's law is really about. And his big emphasis, it's what's going on inside that God sees that really makes sense. The stuff that comes out from you comes from there. Uh, so, so he's addressing a disconnect there in particular on, for those who call on him as Lord, but in their heart are not and as such so <clears throat> great questions and i'll look at i'll look at some of that a little bit more if uh unless is that does that sort of satisfy your answer yeah, your yeah question? Look at it more. okay we can look at it more so i marked where we stopped um so it's it's already 10 after 12 so we're gonna wrap up